the speaker, I am lying and deception. And up until a few years ago, I, I worked pretty much exclusively in the church. I'm a licensed Southern Baptist minister. Uh, felt like I was a skeptical, critical thinker my entire life, and I was for the most part, except for in the area of religion. I have a lot of very, very, very intelligent people in my family, um, some with IQs well over 150, who are still believers to this day. And the transition out was absolutely horrifying. Uh, several years, the entire transition to being completely open and out is still not complete. There's people in my family that know, people that don't. Um, it was worse than losing my mother to cancer. And uh, that was uh, just a, a horrible experience that I cried for days. But I cried more over the loss of my life and um, the time that I spent in religion. And that all started because I uh, decided to engage with an atheist online mm -hmm. because there's no such thing as atheists. There's only people who pretend that there's no God so they can excuse their sin. And I decided that I would talk to this gentleman who was very intelligent, ask him what his questions were, I would find the answers, then I would go a step further, find his rebuttal to my answers, and then find the answers to those rebuttals, and I never spoke to the man again. Uh, after the initial questions and doing the actual work, finding out the original answers, uh, my life fell apart. And so now I am no longer a uh, person of faith, and I, I feel like uh, what's important and my answer to the question on the panel this morning is that we should learn to really evaluate the way that we think and see things. And just because you believe it wholeheartedly and because you got it from a source that you trust and love doesn't make it any more accurate or correct. So um, know what you believe, know what someone else believes, even if it's different than you, and be able to back up their argument the best you can to find faults in their argument as well as yours, and you might find a truth class in the room between them. I'm going to perk this back up a little bit. <laughs> my, my sports feel a bit more fun than his. Uh, my, my mom is Jewish, my dad is Catholic, uh, and they decided instead of fighting over how the children would be raised, they would take them to a bunch of different denominations uh, in our small northern Michigan town. So I went to Methodist, Baptist, Protestant, Catholic, Lutheran, evangelist, went to many different churches, and at an early age, he's like, I'm not sure all of these stories line up accurately with each other. <laughs> and then, I'm a, I'm a writer, so I was tuned into books from a very early age, so I, I think I was 10, I read the Bible cover to cover, and there was uh, an enormous amount of plot holes. <laughs> and, and, and I still can't watch a, any freaking movie without analyzing every tiny plot hole in it, so you can imagine that the Bible was quite an ordeal for a 10-year-old to do. Uh, and from that, it's been pretty steady from that point on. I'm like, you believe what you want to believe, but your story doesn't hold up. A lot of times when you undertake to practice critical thinking in your life, uh, you, you see the phenomena, you have friends that will say, uh, oh, this was this really, I saw this really cool show, show about aliens. And they're really excited about it because it's, it's imaginative and it excites them and it's forcing them to think about things they don't normally think about. And then you as a critical thinker, as a skeptic, sort of look at them and say, you know, that's not real. And, and they end up saying, you, you're killing the joy in everything. <laughs> it, leaves, it leaves some people the impression that if you're a critical thinker, you're almost antithetical to imagination. So as creative individuals, how do you reconcile that seeming contrast between wanting to be analytical and, and use uh, reason, yet being creative and, and entertaining and, and producing the material you do? Is there a conflict there, or do you find a way to accommodate it and, and a way to inject critical thinking into what you do? For, for me, it's, it's the same. Uh, critical thinking and creativity is just using your, your thought process to explore every asset of something. So, you know, if you're writing a book, you're like, well, if I've done this or this, where can I go apart from there? If I'm creating a trick, what's not possible? And how can I make that seem possible? And it's the same thing when you're going, that doesn't seem possible, so try to analyze what makes it possible, what's not, and, and weigh it out. So when you're looking at an issue, climate change, right? 
Um, you do the research and you find, well, it's overwhelmingly this is how it is. If you are trying to create a magic trick, okay, no one's ever done this, and we've got this and this and this and this uh, to use to try to make it look like it's possible. So it's just a matter of actually just using the, the facilities you have inside your head to look at a problem from many different aspects. The same thing when you create something. So it's, it's very natural to me. The part I find that most creative people have trouble with is, is organizational skills and business skills, because that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's kind of poverty. It's, it's, it, there's kind of a dichotomy, because on one hand, I tell people I'm a, I'm a skeptic a comedian, and they say, well, aren't all comedians skeptics? And I'm like, you think so. <laughs> but um, because, you know, the idea of comedy is we're looking at the world and we're looking, we're turning it on its head or looking at something from a different angle that you might not have thought of. The downside, though, is that a lot of times I see comedians and they'll do a joke that has an, an answer, you know? Like they'll say, what's with all these, you know, uh, pharmaceuticals and, and the, the side effects are worse than the, you know, and then the problem. Ha ha, they make a joke about it. I'm like, well, that's because they only have to report, they have to report every side effect. You know, I, I start putting all the reasoning as to why, and it's like, and then I go, it's not funny now. But, you know, there's a nightmare why there are side effects. Like, that's not hilarious. So it's hard sometimes because I, I want to. I don't want to do. I don't want to do something that, that I have the answer to. But also, how do you make it funny without over-explaining and having people know is this a science lecture or, or comedy? And it's, it's hard. It's a hard line to walk. But I think when you get it, it's more interesting for people because they walk away going, "Oh, that was funny," and I didn't know that. You know? Yeah, I don't think that. I don't see any um, being creative or being skeptical. I don't see it being somehow mutually exclusive. At, at all. Um, oftentimes I find magical thinking in the process of being creative is actually sort of boring. Um, if you really want a terrific story, the story of creation that we have discovered today is far more interesting than the, the, or the Western origin story of seven days. Far more interesting in its detail. Um, those of you who read The Martian, I don't know if you got to read that book. Yeah. Wonderful book. Uh, I, I just found it to be sensational in terms of its total time, factual detailing of stuff. I knew I was not reading something that was, you know, imaginative, right? and, uh, but it, it was in its detailing that I thought was so terrific. I don't, I, don't have any, I don't have any problem with it. That's basically my bread and butter as an author, is to take realistic things, hard science, take concepts that every that, that a lot of people understand. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say everybody understands. In this day and age. Take some basic scientific premises as, as the foundation of the building blocks, add in a couple layers of things that you probably don't know unless that is your specialty, uh, and then if I can use reality to build a level of trust that you consider, subconsciously consider the, the author, the narrator, an authority, then when I jump it up into the imaginative area, it's just a step beyond what's real. Uh, the two things go, they go hand in hand very well. So when I, if I do it correctly, I create an entirely scientifically plausible explanation, for example, for all of these monsters running around a small island in Lake Michigan, and if I've done right and made that handshake correct, you are, you buy in all the way. And you buy in deeper than you would for, say, a vampire story or a ghost story, or most people believe their supernatural stuff would for those, because it feels factual and it feels real, and that lets you go farther down the rabbit hole. I, I think I'll be echoing um, my colleagues on the panel, particularly uh, Ian and, and Kurt. My, my critical thinking skills are married to my creativity. It, it, what, it's what helps me um, do what I do. And oftentimes, um, and, and people mean well, uh, they'll say that I'm blessed. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I say thank you, because I know they mean well, but I'm like, no, I, I, I did the work. <laughs> if that's what you mean by blessed. I completely agree with that. And part of what I appreciate about being skeptic is that we take full responsibility for our power to create or destroy. And as we are all creators, so we are using our full potential to create exactly what we have 
conceived in our minds as a musician. You know, it's either something I'm thinking or something I'm feeling, and I am working with all of my power and all of a entire life of dedicated training and you know to create the best music that I possibly can. And that all comes out of harnessing that responsibility as a creator and as a human being. Well, well, actually, when you, now that you say that, when things go wrong, I completely blame the universe. <laughs> that's when you're cursed, as opposed yeah, to... Yeah, that's when I'm cursed. That's when I'm not blessed. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. As a, as a creator, in, in doing the novels that I've done, especially fantasy novels, where you're making up a whole magic system, you're creating your own universe, but you're also putting in the rules that people can discover, and ultimately for them to figure out how your world works, they have to be using critical thinking skills. And I think this is a this is sort of a way that, that we get to use uh, what we know and, and sort of display our worldview, and yet for a lot of people it's totally hidden. Because I will get people to say, you write fantasies, how can we possibly be a skeptic? And it's like, no, dig a little deeper. You know, yeah, open your eyes and, and, and go a little bit further. So so as skeptics, what for you is the is the number one hot button issue? That, that you wish everybody could see as clearly as you do? Obviously, for me, it's religion. Okay. <laughs> that would make my life much simpler. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it, oh, sorry. No, that's fine. I'm married. I'm used to that. <laughs> oh. oh, wait. No, I didn't say that. My wife's here. <laughs> Not for long. Actually, she Not did. Anymore. Uh, they all, she has to cut me off occasionally or she would never get to talk. So now she's going to make you disappear. Right? <laughs> well, I, I think, um, you know, for me, I, I'm always writing new material, trying to come up with a new hour to, you know, to film or whatever. So, but it always boils down to, I realize that in my jokes, all comedians kind of have a formula that they do. I mean, even if it's not exactly written out, but, you know, I, the way I write jokes is the way different is different than the way he analyzes jokes, right? So, for me, all these issues are really the same core issue of, of critical thinking and knowing where to get evidence. And if you can get to, if you know to, if you know what what's good evidence and you know how to put it together critically and think about it critically, you're going to solve all of these issues from religion to you know anything from that we talk about as skeptics to. Bigfoot to, you know, wh wh whatever, alternative medicine, chemtrails, and all this stuff that, that people are, the flat earth that's big now again, I don't know how that will ever happen, but, you know, that's, that's just, that's the main, main issue, is that, you know, that right now we have, because of the internet, I say we have so much information, but we also have so much misinformation and so much disinformation that, that getting through all of that and knowing what's real and knowing what to, where to find good sources and know how to look at these things, um, that to me is the biggest issue to try to, try to explain to people, you know, how to process information. I think I find that one of the um, biggest issues, at least something that weighs on me, is just that people squander their lives and their potentials that by the distractions of religion or false information or um, whatever vehicle it is that, you know, I mean, what a gift it is to be alive and to have this unlimited potential to use your time on this earth to to be a creator or you know to, to shape this world and make a change according to your own will and so many people just squander it and it it blows my mind to think of the state that the world is in and all of the abysmal things that are going on and a lot of that is because people don't take responsibility it's all, it's all God, it's all something else. And if everybody harnessed their responsibility to make a change in the world and, you know, just take full responsibility for themselves as living beings, it, um, that's the biggest thing that waits on me. Uh, on that, on that um, thing about responsibility, I had very quickly uh, an occasion which really put me on the track of trying to work with, with all of you. I was uh, doing the um, Scopes Monkey Trial. Ed Asner and I were going through around the country doing the Scopes Monkey Trial, the, the transcripts. Of it. And uh, we would um, talk at some of these colleges. And I talked to a group of 100 kids, college kids, 
and at the end of the, of the thing, the, the teacher said, uh, oh, you know, well, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know how, how many of you saw the show yesterday, but I re really recommend that you see the show tonight. And I said, thank you very much. And as I was leaving, he gave me a wink, which was, watch this. Look what I'm up against. He said, with a show of hands, now there were about 100, 110 kids there. For the show of hands, how many of you believe that the world was created at 10 o'clock in the morning, October 23rd, 4004 BC? And about 80 kids raised their hands. And I just put my head down. And what I saw was all of this knowledge that I, I derive such pleasure from to, to find out you know, in the morning I get up and I, you know, Google the news and I go, you know, I go to the science part or I go to something or we've discovered something new and all this. But just before the show, there was a girl who had been kind of a, you know, groupie around and she was a very sweet girl and I said, and I told this to the whole cast and I said, um, whatever, you know, Barbara, did you, would you have, oh, would you have raised your hand? She said, oh, yes. I said, why? She said, well, because God is my bus driver. I said, I, I had no idea what that meant. <laughs> she said, um, it means that I can go to the back of the bus and party hardy because God is driving my bus. And I heard that as an abdication of one's own personal responsibility. It didn't hit me like a Mack truck. And I thought from that, I've got to do something about this. <laughs> Was it a short pause? <laughs> you suggested the joke. This is skeptical teamwork right here. It's all in the delivery. <laughs> I, I, I think for me, and, and maybe this is representative of the last vestiges of my naivete, it's it's inhumanity. It's, it's how we treat each other uh, day to day um, as, as people, as citizens of our, our towns, our, our, our states, our country, our world. It, I, you would think, if you read history, that we are so much better, or should be so much further along than our predecessors, and we're just not. You know, our technology has not improved our humanity at all, and some may argue that it has even worsened it. And to Ian's point, it's very easy to become overwhelmed by this barrage of information and, and where you're getting your information from. Is it true? Is it big news? Is it, you know, there's just so much. And I don't have an answer for that uh, for myself. I try to make sure that I'm at least trying to be the best human being that I can. Um, I don't always succeed. And I'm honest about that and try to come back again tomorrow. But there was a campaign a few years ago, um, I believe it was called Pay It Forward, um, and there was these, just these small acts that we can do, and it's not going to uh, necessarily flip the White House in sooner than like, but, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to go there, I'm so bitter. Um, <laughs> but sometimes it's the simple acts of humanity that make a difference. Um, I was online at the grocery store, and the um, cashier looked at me and she said, that'll be $8.16. And I just looked at her, because she hadn't run up my stuff. That was the girl in front of me. And she said, oh, I'm sorry, and she went to the woman in front of me, and I said, oh, it's okay, I just thought we were doing something different. <laughs> you know, I pay for her groceries, she pays for mine, and then the girl in front of me starts laughing. She goes, oh, that'd be great if somebody paid for my groceries. And I said, yeah, that would be great. And I actually thought, yeah, that would be great. So I paid for her groceries. And... <laughs> okay, you're forgetting it was $8.16. <laughs> but she said to me, she said, are you serious? And I'm like, yeah, eight is not going to break me today. <laughs> but it was just so arbitrary. It was just so unexpected. I hadn't planned to do that. 
but I gotta tell you the look on her face and what it meant to her, that was worth every single penny. You know, and she, and if money was an issue because she was about to pull out change from an envelope to pay. And so I make her happy, the cashier is grinning at me, I'm feeling good about myself, the person behind me hates me because I didn't pay for their stuff. <laughs> you know, but it's, again, it's, it's not always the big grand gestures, but how we maybe treat each other moment to moment. Maybe somebody cuts you off in traffic because they got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> really, no, sometimes that can be the reframe that keeps you from being angry and then getting out of your car and being mad at your kids or your family. So, again, my, my hot button is humanity. And if we can embrace that better, you know, maybe when the robot overlords come, <laughs> we'll take pity. <laughs> So, so there's no, a, you've expressed a, a lot of different things, humanity, the need for critical thinking, uh, all of, uh, uh, you know, moving people away from dependence on religion. Uh, and these are all massive issues. And I agree that if we could accomplish all of those, it would be a much better place. And John, you're talking about the Scopes trial and, and, and you know, essentially bringing that back to life for a lot of people. Is there, can you guys think of any particular issue that we normally address in the area of skepticism that we could really rally around, that that could be one that we could use as a spear point to really push this stuff? And, and, and for example, for me, uh, every morning reading science stories and stuff like that, I love fossils, I love dinosaurs, I love that whole evolution thing. I think with cute baby animals and dinosaurs, we could conquer the world. And get people to think about that. Am, am, am I on the right track, or, or is there another issue that we probably ought to focus on? Well, can I jump in there because I, I'm 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 so upset, and I have a feeling that people up here are, and so are you. I'm so upset with the amount of lying that's going on. Mm. It's just it's so gross. It's just so gross. I, I was thinking recently. It's, it's a little bit like being in a swimming pool. You know, you're in a swimming pool. You can see. It, and then somebody throws in a big bucket of dye. And at first you can see that dye. But as it begins to dissipate, you can see it less, but it goes all around you until you are finally, along with all of us, we are surrounded by it. I think that there's something that can be done, or at least talked about. There is value in telling the truth. There is value. And there's value in recognizing the truth, which is critical thinking. <laughs> there is value, so it's not just about the fact that, you know, I really want to get rid of this professor. But there's, there's, there's value in what type of person that we want. And it's not that person, but it's this type of person. And, and, and so for me, um, beginning to concentrate a little bit on the truth. You know, I had a, <clears throat> kind of a, a scary moment arguing online, which I do all the time, unfortunately. Um, Stop doing that. All of my damn time. Um, but I had, I had uh, those who know me know that that's what I do these days. Um, but I was, uh, I was talking with a friend, and it was, it was about politics, and um, you know, they're talking about news sources and which news sources are real and which ones, you know, which one's not fake news. Apparently everything's fake news that's not Fox News to this person. So I posted a, a bunch of studies. Um, and, you know, looking at the, at the, who reports facts most, which, you know, which um, outlets, you know, whether it's BBC or NPR, or, and three different studies that came to basically the same results, roughly the same results. And I said, here, look at this. You know, they were, they're reporting facts 97% of the time. They're reporting facts 60% of the time, 17% of the time over here. And and he said, my friend, the friend guy I know, came back to me and said, well, whose facts? And I'm like, now we're not even talking about whether it's whether this these three studies are are accurate. Now he's arguing about whether or not the facts that they're reporting on. Are real facts? Who's facts? I mean, it's the same thing. And I'm thinking to myself, is he just lying to me, or does he really think that there are a different set of facts depending on, like facts are like opinions, or is he just 
just is it cognitive dissonance? I don't know what it is. Like, what, how, how can how can you say that? And say who's facts? I mean, is that an outright lie, or is or is it, are these just are people just so twisted that there is no objective truth anymore? Uh, I had. Uh, <coughs> Is it all right? Go ahead. I had a, I had a, 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 I was talking to a group and I, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I did the Scopes monkey trial and I'm now working on the transcripts for the um, 2005 um, intelligent design trial. And isn't it amazing that you know, 80 or 85 years later that we're still talking about this issue of evolution? That's awesome. A woman came up to me afterwards. She looked a little frazzled when she came up. And I wasn't quite sure what was going to happen. And she said, do you know why we're still talking about evolution? And I said, yeah, again, I didn't know which way she was going. I said, no. She said, because it's not mentioned in the Bible. And I said, well, neither are dishwashers. <laughs> and she said, yes, they are. <laughs> And took off. <laughs> and, wow. Now that's real. I have seen that. Uh, there's something that's taking place right there. Yeah. This, and I don't know. I don't know how you get there. I don't know how you get there. How do you get past there? That's the yeah. Wow. That's. Yeah. <laughs> people, people can justify believing whatever they want to. Uh, I, I had a, a discussion with a close personal friend when I came out of him as I'm not a believer anymore. And over the period of months, he finally was really honest with me. And I appreciate that, but it was saddened at the same time. And he said, look, you, you're just better at talking than I am. And honestly, if you could prove to me with all the facts, without a shadow of a doubt, that God was not real, I'd still believe it because it's just too comfortable for me. So if that's if that's if you if you base your life on how you feel and base your facts on what you feel, then there are two sets of facts, and you can justify anything that you want to. And so to me, the issue is how how do we process truth and lies and information, and how do we think through those things? You know, uh, as a uh, performing in all these different denominations, they used to have a lot of problems with that because. You know, in the deep south, I live in Alabama, and so if, you, if you're if you Baptist, all the people that are charismatic are going to hell um, because they're speaking in tongues and doing all these things that are glorifying themselves and not God, so obviously they're not saved. And then I do a show in a charismatic church, and I'm going, these are great people, but all the Baptists are going to hell. They don't know I'm on the way to hell, you know, and like, because you don't speak in tongues and you're, you don't have the Holy Spirit living inside you. And, so I was doing all these denominations for years, and I always had a problem trying to, to figure that out. And now I realize there's not, you know, 50 denominations, 100 denominations, 1,000 denominations. There's as many different beliefs in God as there are people who believe in God. Every single one of them believes something different than somebody else. So, you know, if, if there was a God, he's doing a pretty bad job of letting everybody know what he really thinks. So... I got, uh, my brother is born again, and we have largely the same upbringing, same parents, same towns, uh, you know, started to go different ways in college, but he has found his religion through his wife and his family, and uh, we get along pretty well. We, he doesn't talk to me about his belief, I don't talk to him about my lack of belief, um, because in our family, the, the uncle being around for the nephews and nieces is more important than either of our particular Lisa, so now those kids are getting older and going off on their own, own way. So we had a family gathering, and really, for the first time, I'm going to guess in 25 years, my brother and I sat down and had a really in-depth conversation about these things. And I was, you know, this is a person, This is a, he's a pillar of his community, he is a teacher, he is a football coach, he has done more for people that aren't related to him than anyone I know, uh, and he is exemplary individual, very smart, and we sat down and talked, and we started, we got talking about Trump, we got talking about fake news, and, uh, and it became, I became aware that he actually does believe all of this news is fake. Um, and I started to dive deeper, and related to your question, one of the things that I think is important is the messages he's been getting from 
a large portion of the media for so long is that he is a piece of garbage because of his gender, the color of his skin, etc. And he has been inundated with these messages to the point where he just starts to tune a lot of it out. And it's selective, it's, it's selective perception without a doubt. And he does follow a lot of the actual facts of what's going on, but at some point he started to hear a message that, hey, you know what, all those things that people are telling you, you're just this horrible individual, maybe that's not believable at all. And people have grasped onto this almost like uh, their, their perception of a light preserver. And to answer the question, I think a, a big thing we can do is just, as hard as it is, be a leader and not be an asshole online or a jerk to people that you know. If they believe something different from you, you will get, you will have far more effect and penetration on things by ha doing the best to have a discussion than you will by berating them and calling them stupid. Because now stupid has become a badge of honor. Like a lot of insults in our culture, in American culture over the past 250 odd years, you keep calling people names and at some point they grasp onto that name and sort of create an identity around it and treat it as a badge of honor. And right now being stupid has become a bit of a badge of honor. And it's it was pretty scary. It was like this is this is a person that I know better than I know him well as maybe five or six people on this whole planet that I know very well and watching the change that has happened in him. And he wasn't insulting, he wasn't demeaning, he wasn't telling me I was going to hell, etc. all these things. But to watch it was was pretty impressive. So being a, being a leader and resisting the temptation to berate people who don't believe what you believe is extremely difficult, but it can be very, very important in staying present, present in both the lives of strangers and in people that you know. That's kind of what we're up against. And, um, you know, I, the times I have spent in church, I have been a hired gun in church choirs to get money. But, um, <laughs> um, and, you sit back and watch these people, that, you know, you watch a preacher telling this congregation, I have the answers, and this is the truth, and you don't have to think about it. Um, turn that switch off, I've got the answers for you, I will comfort you, and that to me is what has created kind of where we are today with the acceptance of all this false information and the fake news and everything is that it's come from these people, and I, I, on one hand, you do have people that are sort of snowed by religion, but you find also with technology nowadays, there's a whole generation of people growing up that don't have any interest in thinking. It's like if you've ever seen Idiocracy. It's like it's happening, and people don't want to think, and you approach them with things to think about, and it, it takes them way out of their comfort zone, and people are, when you take someone out of their comfort zone, their knee-jerk reaction is to just go right back to it, and to call you names, and give you the finger and get away from you because you're making them uncomfortable. And that's what we're up against. It's hard to, it, it's hard to stop that knee-jerk reaction, and I would say that is definitely the vast majority of people in this case. So, so if belief is, is based in emotion, and, and to follow up, for a lot of people, emotion is truth. Uh, is there a way, and with, and with skepticism being, you know, rational thinking, critical thinking, uh, which tends to drain the emotions out of it because you want to be looking at the facts, is there a way that we as skeptics can engage emotionally and try and talk on their level, get an understanding there, and, and pull them over? I mean, you know, Scott, you're talking about being very tolerant and, and listening. Is there a step that we can go beyond that to, to try and, and create a stronger bond so that we can draw them toward, you know, feeling good about critical thinking? Isn't that, isn't that kind of what infu couching it or infusing it into art is? I mean, if you, you, have, a, you have emotional responses to paintings, to music. Um, like I said, I've been at, um, I grew up with it. 70s and 80s in Northern California. So I, my, I grew up in heavily involved in the Bay Area punk rock scene. So every influential band when I was a kid growing up was an atheist. Like, you know, so I would go to music when I was, you know, go to Berkeley and San Francisco when I was like 14 years old and you hear these bands singing and it's like, they're talking about religion, you know, and, and how and religion and politics and, and, and I was already in that mindset. But I know so many people that are my age, that were influenced, that were influenced and changed because of 
the music that they love, and then listening to the lyrics and going, oh, what is what is this guy saying? And band, bands like Bad Religion with you know, Ray Graffin, who's a, who's a professor, and he's a super smart guy. And I know so many people that became atheists <laughs> by listening to Bad Religion. I mean, it, it, it sounds silly, <laughs> but they were influenced by that and going, oh, what's this guy talking about? And they're reading the lyrics and going, wow, this is really smart. What does this mean? And then going and reading books and going, oh, what does that mean? Or, um, and I've had many people come up after shows, because I do shows at the regular comedy clubs, and sometimes I walk people they don't like what I do. And other times I have people come up and go, that thing that you said, was that, are you sure about that? And I say, well, you know, I'm as sure as I could be. I would have done it, you know. And, and they say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna check that out. I'm gonna get back to you. And because they were laughing and they were having a good time and all of a sudden they realized, oh wait, there's something off. I'm laughing because there's an inconsistency here. And, and, um, and that emotional response makes them think about it. And then they go, and I think that's one definite way that we can get people. In, in my work, I just hold a mirror up to it. Um, I create a lot of religions from whole cloth in my work, uh, particularly in my far future sci-fi, and all literally all I'm doing is changing the names of the existing major religions. And I'm using, <laughs> I'm using all the same tenets, largely all the same scripture, and I populate the story with people who are fervent believers in this fake religion, and First rule is don't make them caricatures. These are living, breathing characters with wants and needs and, and, and emotions. Try and make the reader identify with these characters. And then at some point, with some readers, not all, but at some point, readers will kind of clue into it. They go, wait a minute, this guy that I think is being ridiculous for his diehard fervent beliefs in this thing is basically believing in something that's almost identical to what I believe in. And that's a way to um, non-confrontationally go make people think and like your like your jokes. Yeah, but that's a story. So. Yeah, well, it, it, it's still everybody has their they have their moment of awakening to be open up. Characters who are fighting and dying for this cause over here that is so ludicrous that would never happen in real life. And then at some point, some of them flips a switch and go, yeah, well, that's basically that's the same story I read in the Bible last week. Things don't change. So. I. I think curiosity, as opposed to condemnation, which is really difficult when the subject is dear to heart and passionate. But if you can keep that sort of running in the background of your mind and you know step up to the adultness of it, um, I think it can help. If you can catch yourself in the moment and express curiosity, like, hmm, what what do you mean there? Can you explain? And sometimes people just need to be heard. And giving someone the space to do that, and I don't mean standing on a soapbox trying to convert you, but having an honest conversation. Um, especially uh, in social media, which is really hard. Um, I, someone posted something on my page, and just, just to be clear, I'm of the block delete crowd. I'm, I'd love to have a block party. Um, I'm not above it because I, I don't I don't like rude discourse. If your opening salvo is an insult, we can't have a conversation. You know, I, I want it to be adult and respectful. Um, but someone I don't even remember what it was. Someone posted something on on my page that was like, hmm? and my first thought was to respond angrily. But I, I have a friend of mine who said, you know, before you respond, before you hit the entry key, ask yourself, do you want to make an enemy? Or do you want to make a friend? And so I took a minute, walked away, uh, had a glass of wine, came back. Uh, and I, I typed in, I'm like, hey, what did you mean by that? And it turned out he was trying to make a joke. And you know, sometimes if you don't joke slang for a living, it doesn't come across in sans serif type. <laughs> and when he explained himself, I'm like, I'm glad I didn't respond angrily with my with my first thought. I'm glad I asked and clarified um, for my own peace of mind. It's not always that neat. It really isn't. But if we can, again, be curious about each other, because these beliefs, these foundations did not come out of nowhere. And you're not going to change somebody's mind by you know yelling at them or, or pointing the finger. That's just not how that works at all. Um, but sometimes some honesty and curiosity might actually plant that seed. 
So is this a, is this a battle that, that we can, you know, is, is there going to be five years from now a, a skeptic megachurch on a television station somewhere <laughs> where watch, we're watching tens of thousands of people come to the way of reason? Or is this going to be a battle that we have to win, you know, in one-on-one -on -one skirmishes, you know, through through social media? I mean, is it, how do you, how do you guys see us and, and the skeptics movement moving forward? I mean, if we haven't been rounded up by then? <laughs> well, yeah, if, if we get out of Guantanamo, uh, what are we going to do? I, I think it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. I think it's going to take following a certain leadership group over the cliff and watching really bad things happen. And then, you know, the emperor's clothes are, are taken off and even... Aside from the most diehard, but still relatively rational people will be like, well, I was really dumb to follow that. And he was lying all along. He or she was lying all along, <laughs> etc. But I think it's got to get worse, because if people don't see things by now, holy cats, you know? But there's so many people that when they realize they're wrong, they're so afraid to admit it. That they double down. That's what it takes a really bad. Really bad. Really bad hasn't yeah. happened yet. Okay. Buckle up, everybody. <laughs> I, I, I see hope in our kids. And in, in my kids, like, when when we decided to talk to them and say, hey, look, we know what we believe in stuff, uh, we may have been wrong. We're like, oh, thank God. <laughs> my kids grew up in churches all over, and they're going, this just doesn't make sense. Like, my kids are way smarter than I am to start with, so that's good. But the friends that they hang out with, the, my kids, I've got 16 to 23-year-olds, and they look at the news and the politics and the religion and all the things, and they're going, why are adults so stupid, <laughs> right? Like, so my kids had, one of the greatest things, we were watching, um, a rerun of All in the Family. And so this was several years back. So my youngest son's like, hey, he's like, is there, is there, they didn't put the second half of the show. I'm like, no, that was it. He's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. So what do you mean? He goes, well, the whole thing was the, the boy and the girl couldn't go get a picture made together. That doesn't make any sense. I said, well, this was the 70s and he was black and she was white. It was a big deal. He's like, okay, you're messing with me. So what did they do in the second half of the show? I'm like, no, no, that was it. Like, I'm serious. That was really a big deal. He's like, you're kidding me. No, I'm not kidding. And he just cannot fathom a world where a black kid and a white kid can't get their picture made together. And then I'm thinking, man, everything's great. And then a couple years later, they got black kids and Mexican kids and Puerto Rican kids and stuff all over the house. And they're, they're making fun. They're doing, like, racial jokes at each other. And so I'm like, whoa, hey, what's the deal? And they're like... You guys have a problem with this. We don't. We're making fun of you. <laughs> they're making fun of the, the, the fact that adults get so upset. They're like, look, we're all friends. And, and so, I said, are you sure? Because sometimes, like to me, like I'm thinking, okay, you, you're making fun of this kid who's from Mexico, and he may be playing along. He doesn't think it's so funny. And he's like, Dad, you're just gamer tag. And it's like little Mexican. And like, no, he, he told us, this is what I want to be called, this little Mexican. So I still, like, I have a hard time thinking that maybe he's just playing along for their benefit. But then I start looking at the way they handle social issues, and they're going, racism is stupid, I can't believe anybody ever, why did this ever, why was this ever a thing, right? And it's the white kids and the black kids and the Puerto Rican kids and the Mexican kids. And so maybe it's a small <laughs> pocket, but I, the, my... My, my hope the future is our kids, because they look at us, and they look at our politics, and they look at our religion, and the way we yell at each other. My kids, I'm on Facebook, my kids aren't. My kids are like, that, that, is, that is poison. You need to get off of that. <laughs> right? <laughs> and I'm like, hey, you got good kids. So that, that's where my hope lies. Uh, uh, maybe I'm blind, but that's, I'm leaving it to them. I, I agree with you. That, that's been my uh, experience so far. Uh, as to the current situation, winter is coming, <laughs> and uh, and I think that there will be a um, a blowback. I think that there will be a, a the pendulum will go the other way, and I ha I take enormous amount of um, 
solace in the fact that um, at least many of the kids, albeit not the 80 who raised their hands in the day, um, uh, understand what's going on and, um, and have jumped the line, as we can see with, you know, same-sex marriage and all this type of stuff. All of a sudden it's like, poof, and we've jumped. And um, I, 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 my biggest concern is uh, religion when it gets weaponized. Um, I don't care what people believe. If they listen, if the hurricane is coming and you want to pray to somebody or something that the, you know it's not going to blow down, down the house, I'm sure it, it, it's a, uh, yes. And I'm not going to make fun of that person, and and that's just fine. I don't like it when. Uh, when somebody tells me that well, I'm going to go back to this thing, you know, the Earth was created in 4004 BC, you kind of go, listen, you know, Bishop Usher came up with that idea about 400 years ago. He was a smart guy, but that was the best they could do then. We learned a lot more. You've got to move on. You've got to take it back to, you know, to the minus 43 or something like that. So, and you can still have God. You can still have an imaginary being. You can still, no one will argue with you about that. They can't. But October 23rd, 10 o'clock in the morning, then it becomes the belief system, as far as I'm concerned, has now gone out into the public square. And the minute you are in the public square, you're no longer in the privacy of your home. In the privacy of your home, believe what you want. You come out into the public square, I'm sorry. You can be criticized. You have to be able to substantiate what you have to say. And this whole thing of being unput upon, you don't believe what I believe, and you're making me feel bad. Hey, man, you're in the public square. <laughs> so s stay out of the public square. I think we have a microphone set up over there. We've got about eight minutes, so if people want to ask questions from the audience, uh, we'd be happy to entertain those. Can I ask a question? Yes, you it was, it was based on uh, both of you actually believing, you know, kind of like the song, the children are our future. Um, I'm sitting here thinking that at some point, each of our generations here, we were the kids. We were the future. What happened to us? And how do we? How does that not happen to the next group of kids that comes up and then starts paying bills and life gets real? Like, what? What, what was that change? How did we stop? How did we stop being that? And how do we prevent that from happening again? I don't, I don't know if there's an answer to that. I, I think the world's better each generation in a lot of ways, but we really? just get we get more bad press. Like no. violent crimes way down from the seventies. Way way down. From Race, 1770s completely. Right. Yeah. Racism is still a problem, but it's 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 made steps forward. Um, you know, there's a lot of things you know, we we thought we had the flat Earth thing squashed out, but it's been raising its ugly head. But it'll go away again. It, it, we're always going to have problems, and we're always going to have difficulties. But we've got more information, and so I, I do think it's gotten better. It's just we get the bad news so much easier. You know, it, 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 there's a, there's a, everybody has a megaphone now. If so, somebody shot somebody in Ohio, you wouldn't hear about it 20 years ago. But now it's on your Facebook, your YouTube, your Google, sure. the moment you open it. <laughs> so you just, it's, it's easy to gravitate towards the bad. Go ahead. How are you guys doing? Thanks a lot for uh, this panel. Uh, it was very excellent. I like it. Uh, funny. Um, Thank you. My friends <laughs> and I attended the uh, Skeptics panel earlier this morning. We got into a quite lengthy discussion about this topic uh, during our lunch. And the issue was, uh, somebody up there talked about, you know, having a soft approach. Maybe using humor, maybe using art to bring them over. And right from our lunch discussion, I just looked over at them like, never gonna happen. Uh, because this is what they're raised with, is what they're indoctrinated with, the, the fear of shutting, the fear of going to that dark place, hell, whatever you want to call it, uh, is so ingrained that even if you could peel off a percentage, you're never going to get the numbers that are going to swing 
the elections we need for federal judgeships, for skeletons, for, for president, clean water, women's rights, uh, gay rights, voter enfranchisement, etc. So, and I'm asking this, this is my question, isn't it better to just pretend these people don't exist? Don't reason, <laughs> don't try to make logic, don't try to convert and get them over to our side. Forget about them. Focus on what we want as a mass, as a group, and get the judges we want, get the president we want, and we should learn how to win instead of trying to beat them. Isn't that the better tact? And one more thing, as a marketing professional every day, the issue is with the children. We are not in control of the information. And as long as we're not in control, we're not going to be in control of the kids. And we're going to continue to go down the path of Texas where even though we know the science says abstinence doesn't work, they do it anyway, uh, the, the policy abstinence only, and more kids get pregnant. As long as we're not in control of information, we're never going to be in control of kids, which means they're going to become adults and make bad decisions. Well, we're, not, we're not in control of information everywhere. We're not in control of all uh, understood, information. Understood, right? Just uh, Texas as a bellwether is not necessarily indicative of the overall nation as a whole. So we can take these, we can take these isolated areas and you've got to compare that to the rest of the country as well as places that free information is flowing. And, and going back to your question, do we play to win or play to not lose? I'm not sure I see the difference. I think it depends on personality style. Like, Jamie Ian Swiss is not going to have the same encounter with somebody that I would have. Some people, it's better to go, okay, I can get more done if I ignore this and I focus here. Other people go, I care too much about this. If I can talk to a thousand of those people and one of them have an experience like I had, I'd rather do that. So what works for you and your approach could be different than mine. We've got two comedians here and they've already said they approach comedy completely differently. That's what makes life beautiful. You are not me, I am not you, but you do what you do, I do what I do, and maybe between us we can make a difference. May I add one more thing? No, no, hang on, hang on, because we're, we're literally coming down to the end of it, so I want everybody else to get a chance to address it. I'm a little torn. Uh, I would love to ignore folks. I really would, and just go about my life. The question is, are they ignoring me? Are they letting me go about my life, or, or is their mission to get in my way and affect my quality of life, which makes it difficult for me to ignore their shenanigans. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm trying to be me, somebody else that I'm ignoring is making my life difficult, politically, economically, socially, making it impossible for me to ignore that being. That's my concern. You know, but I'll be, I'll be in my own little world and I won't see the truck coming that comes to get me. But I don't know why we can't do all of those things. Like we can, you can, you don't have to go out and try to convert everybody. Um, but I also don't see why we have to ignore everybody. I, I mean, I, I don't think that it's completely I mean, I think there are. I think there are a lot of people out there. I've seen people come to reason in my time. I've seen lots of them do it. I've seen also reasonable people who are seemingly reasonable people, people go the other direction in my time. So I think there's always an ebb and flow. And I, I think I think there are kids are um, different now. And I think I think that's going to help. But at the same time, magical thinking. I, I believe that there's a good, a huge chunk of us. I think it's an evolutionary. I'm not sure what the, what the trait was, what, what it was uh, some selected for, but I think that it's it's something that, that a vast majority of people have, and just naturally, we have to you have to teach people to 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 get past that, and they're not just going to do that on their own. It's going to be education. It's going to be how we teach in schools. It's going to be um, how we teach one on one. How we teach our kids. How we talk to people. So that the things that people are influenced with these talks, you know, music, with all everything. We'll, get, we'll always get a tide moving one direction. And, and once the tide moves one direction, hopefully, you know, I mean, look, look at, look at, you talk about politics. I mean, if you, if you look at all these issues that we're at right now, if you do a poll, it's, it's you know, marriage equality and, and, and um, so, much, so many things. It's like 65 to 35, okay? Yet, we just don't get out and vote. That's the problem, you know, so, so the, the, the minds are there. 
people want people want health care. People want these things, but if you don't get out and vote, you don't get it. So so I mean look at the last election. Fifty percent of the population that was eligible to vote didn't even vote. So you're dealing with twenty-five percent, twenty-five percent, and this one twenty-five percent gets twenty-five and a half and they win. You know? And that's what's happening. They get the electoral college. Right, well exactly. Or they, they there's a lot of, but we're never gonna move until we start moving things to a, to a certain to a certain direction, um, which takes force and it takes people going out and saying, you need to go to this, you need to go to that, and sitting and talking to people one-on-one, -on -one, and, and and you're never going to get the general population to start moving in the direction to be to, to, to be activists and, 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 and get, get a, a larger, uh, larger uh, selection of the population to work, you know, to work that direction. Thank you, guys. And I want to uh, have you all please thank our panelists. This was absolutely <laughs>